Hi, my name is Dan Helene. I am the Deputy Director of PacWave. As part of the Offshore Renewable Energy and Working Waterfronts webinar, um, I will be here to talk to you a little bit about my experience and the project's experience uh, developing a wave energy test facility off the coast of Oregon. So firstly, I'll give a brief view about what PacWave is, um, including why such a facility is needed and what it will be used for. Uh, talk about how we got here, including agency and stakeholder involvement, um, especially in the siting and permitting processes. Um, I'll also, as part of the permitting, talk a little bit about the environmental monitoring requirements that we have and how those were developed. And then touch on you know the potential benefits of the project and um, sort of our next steps. So what is PacWave? We're a globally recognised open ocean wave energy test facility. We don't actually do the testing. What we do is provide the infrastructure to allow developers to test wave energy technology. Uh, we're part of Oregon State University. Um, the main campus of OSU is located in Corvallis, Oregon, which is about 35 miles in from the coast. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the facility itself is based out of Newport in Oregon, which is the nearest coastal town. We're primarily funded by the US Department of Energy uh, through the Water Powers Technology Office. And the primary purpose of PacWave is to provide wave energy converter or WEC developers with the opportunity to uh, optimize WEX and arrays of WEX, small, you know, arms of devices, you know, three, four, five devices, to increase their energy capture, to improve their survivability and reliability, really proving the technology, uh, to refine deployment O and M and recovery procedures. The test sites will be connected to the grid, so uh, a critical piece of testing is collecting grid interconnection data and then gathering information about the potential environmental effects and potential economic and social benefits of uh, wave energy. Secondary purpose is uh, the generation of power. So why do we need uh, test wave energy test facilities? Um, a recent report by the National Renewable Energy Lab, NREL, which came out in February of this year, um, estimated that the total energy resource in the wave uh, marine energy resource in the 50 states is equivalent to about 60% of the power that was generated in the US in 2019. So there's huge potential for wave energy. Um, and along the West Coast, uh, particularly because of the the really pretty incredible wave resources that we have. However, globally, there is almost no commercial wave energy operations at the moment. And there's a number of challenges to the wave energy industry, and they're not necessarily unique to this industry. Um, funding being one of them, um, the levels of funding, both uh, private and public, that's been uh, going into wave energy has has not been huge. It's increasing, um, but so far it has not been as great as some of the uh, funding that's been invested in other technologies. The key thing is is the uh, limited availability of infrastructure for testing. Um, it's absolutely critical for these developers of technology to be able to prove the viability of the technology at full scale in the open ocean, um, but simply developers can't afford to build the testing infrastructure that's required um, if to do that on their own. They're relying on other people to provide this infrastructure. Um, and there's only a handful of uh, commercial scale wave energy test facilities in the world. Um, another challenge to the wave energy industry, and a lot of these challenges are interrelated, but um, there's a lack of technology convergence. Um, it's currently estimated that there's about 250 different wave energy technology types out there under development. Uh, some of these are no more than sketches on a, on a piece of paper. Um, some are full scale devices, you know, having open ocean testing. Um, these 
250 types fall in loosely into about nine different categories. Um, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about the, the uh, different types of wave energy technology in a second. Um, developing this technology is, is slow and costly. Uh, open ocean tests go on for one year to multiple years, and then, you know, the companies make changes to their device and then they have to go out and do more testing. So it's slow and it's costly. Another challenge to the industry is the regulatory and environmental um, situation. Uh, there's multiple federal and state agencies and jurisdictions. And there's also um, a perceived level of environmental uncertainty. Uh, the regulations that exist uh, weren't written with uh, the marine industry in mind. They were largely written uh, based on oil and gas. Um, and there's been very few devices in the water. So there's very little environmental data um, that's been gathered around devices that can feed into and be used in the regulatory process. Um, as an example, there have been two federal licenses for wave energy power generation issued in the US. Uh, one was issued uh, around 2012, I believe, um, and that project never went ahead. And the second one that has been issued was Pathway, my project, and uh, that was issued on March in March of this year. So this is new technology. So I, I mentioned the the lack of um, convergence in technology. This slide just shows you that uh, there's a lot of different technologies out there. I'm just going to give you a very brief overview of, of just a handful of these technologies. First, what we have here at the top is what you probably traditionally think of as, as a wave energy device. Um, this is a point absorber, absorber device, which basically sits in the water and moves up and down with the waves generating power. These are two examples here. This is Ocean Power Technologies Power Buoy. Um, and this is a company called Sea Power, previously Columbia Power Technologies, and this is their Stingray. This is a prototype device waiting for deployment on its side. Basically, it's rotated up, and then these two floats move with the waves. Second type is the attenuator device, which is basically an articulated joint between um, pieces of the of the device itself that generate power through the movement of the waves. This device is the Palamas device, um, was probably one of the most advanced wave energy devices. Um, the company has unfortunately since gone out of business, although the technology may come back. Now, another type is the oscillating wave surge or flapper, as I tend to call it. Um, you can see the scale of the device here. You can see some people um, standing by this device, which is Aquamarine Power's Oyster device. And basically the waves move the the flap of this back and forth. Um, and then we have Resolute Marines device. This is a much smaller device. You can see a person here. I will touch on this uh, a, a little bit later, but um, this is actually the primary function is um, to run reverse osmosis. Um, but again, using wave power to, to do that. It's an interesting application. Uh, Another type of device is the submerged pressure differential. This is an interesting device because generally these sit on the seafloor. Um, this is a company called Bombora, and this is actually an Oregon-based company, M3 Wave. This was a deployment of, I think, a quarter scale device um, a few years ago. And the idea is, is this sits on the seafloor. There's a chamber at either end, air filled chamber. And as the wave comes over one end of the chamber, it compresses it, forces air through this tube between the two chambers, which has a bi-directional turbine in, and the air is forced into this chamber. As the wave passes on, it compresses the second chamber and forces the air back. Um, there's no surface expression with these, so it's nice that below the, you know, away from the waves and protected from storms and so on sitting on the seafloor. Another type of device is the horizontal pendulum device um, or rotating mass. Uh, the interesting thing about this technology is there's no moving parts on the outside of the of the WEC. Um, these are 
actually two uh, generations of the same company's device. It's a company called Wello, and for some reason their device is called the Penguin. Hence a little penguin on the side here. And basically it's in, in, an inherently unstable hull. So it's moving like this and forces causes the mass, um, the pendulum inside to rotate much like an old fashioned self-winding watch. And then the last technology I'll just touch on is an oscillating water column. Um, this basically is you have an air chamber uh, and as the waves come in, the pressure in the chamber, the waves come in, the pressure is increased, the air is compressed, forced out through a turbine, and then as the waves retreat, the air is sucked back in. Um, these are two devices. This is the Ocean Links device, which actually didn't end up uh, very successful. And uh, this is Ocean, Engine, Ocean Energy's device. Um, this is a prototype. You can see handrails here to give you a sense of scale. And the reason I point that out is you'll see the full scale ocean energy device uh, in, a, in a minute. There's also alternative uses of wave energy that aren't for commercial scale power generation. Uh, Department of Energy has coined the term powering the blue economy. Um, there's very, I'm not going to talk about all of these, but there's various applications. One of the key ones is, is small scale community scale power generation. Um, this is probably where you're first going to see wave energy coming in is isolated communities like in Alaska that run on diesel generators. Um, very expensive to generate power and also not really the cleanest way of doing it. There's great opportunities there. Um, desalination, I just mentioned the Resolute Marine device. Uh, interesting in that it's deployed, you can deploy it off a beach, two of these flapper devices, both pumping water back to shore. Um, and they have a containerized system. One of them, the water goes in and runs a generator to generate electricity. And the second container contains a reverse osmosis unit. Power from the first container generates the power for the RO unit and you produce clean water without having to be connected to the grid. Um, there's also uh, people working on autonomous underwater vehicle recharge. This uh, illustration is the OPT power buoy teamed up with Saab, who have a, an AUV known as the Sabertooth. The idea is, is that these AUVs can do a huge amount of research and work and maintenance um, without requiring a ship. Um, for most of the time, one of the limitations is, is the power that they can have on board. They either require lots of batteries or they need to be recharged. And the thinking here is that you could have docking stations and allow these AUVs to recharge and stay out there doing their work for prolonged periods. I'm not really going to cover the others apart from just this here, which is actually interesting. This is a Microsoft data center that was deployed underwater. And again, there'll be another picture of it later. Um, data centers you, uh, require a lot of cooling and therefore a lot of power. So one of the ideas is to deploy them under the sea where they naturally get cooled and power them with wave energy. So there's lots of different uh, potential applications. So why are we citing a wave energy test facility in Oregon? Um, Oregon's pretty uniquely positioned in North America to be a leader in wave energy. Um, the resources, as I mentioned, off the Pacific Northwest, the wave energy resources are significant. Um, in Oregon, there's also a, a robust electrical transmission system, which is really important if you're generating the power somewhere, you want an existing transmission system. Um, you don't want to have to be running more transmission lines because that's cost prohibitive. Uh, there's a good transportation and port infrastructure in Oregon. Um, there's a very experienced and established marine manufacturing and marine supply chain. Um, there's strong support uh, throughout Oregon from, from a local up through to our federal delegation. There's strong support for testing activities associated with marine energy, not necessarily commercialization, but testing. Um, and there's also leading research institutes. Oregon State University has been working on wave energy from an engineering and modeling standpoint and, and environmental standpoint for, for um, probably since 
2005 or so. So Packwave itself, um, we have two sites. Uh, this is Newport, for those who don't know, here's Oregon. Um, so north of Newport, we have Packwave North, which is it's um, currently exists. It's a, for standalone testing. It's not grid connected. Um, generally for testing smaller scale devices, prototypes, all these powering the blue economy technologies. Packwave South, which is our primary test site um, is still in development. Um, it will be a state-of-the-art pre-permitted, which is important, accredited grid-connected wave energy test facility. Most of my focus now uh, moving forward is going to be on Packwave South. Um, so the test site uh, is in federal waters. This is the jurisdictional line between state and federal waters. However, the cables that you see here run between, run through both federal and state waters. The site's about seven miles offshore. It's about 10 miles to Newport, uh, maximum depth of 260 feet. The site itself is going to be divided up into four test berths. So we can have four different developers testing at any one time. Um, each of the test berths will have a dedicated subsea cable running back to shore to carry power and data. And we have a fifth cable for instrumentation. Um, we're going to be licensed for up to 20 megawatts of power, uh, which is pretty significant, and a maximum of 20 devices at any one time, which gives us the ability to test either individual devices or small arrays of devices. As I mentioned, five subsea cables. Uh, this is where the, you know, the fact that testing is can be, or developing a test facility can be cost prohibitive. Subsea cables are um, expensive. We have about 60 miles in total of subsea cables. Power and data come back to shore. And then we have a terrestrial facility, facility called our utility connection and monitoring facility. And from there, the power that's generated is monitored, conditioned, and then fed onto the local grid. Um, the design and permitting phase is just completed for this project. We're about to move into construction. We hope construction is going to start in June of 2021. And we hope to be operational in 2023. Just to give you an idea of what the test site might look like, this is um, with 20 devices deployed. Um, the site's two nautical miles, um, two square nautical miles, two nautical miles north-south. This is rotated north to the right, um, and one mile east-west. Five devices, five devices, five devices, five devices. So four different developers going on, and then the auxiliary cable for instrumentation. Just to give you a little bit about the, the pieces of the project, the subsea cables, as I mentioned, are a major part of the project. Um, these, this is a carousel carrying cables on a cable ship prior to cable installation. Um, the cables are going to terminate in a subsea connector. We will provide one half of it with the cable. The developers will provide the other half and connect to their devices. Um, these are called dry mate connectors in that they're pulled to the surface and connections are made on a vessel, not while they're underwater. If developers are testing a number of devices, they then need basically a, a, a hub to connect multiple devices. And then the whole system, you know, every device is going to be anchored in some way. And I mentioned that this is more oil and, you know, the oil and gas industry, the anchoring systems here are enormous. You can see some people here on the, to give you some idea of scale. These are multiple, you know, tens of tons, 20 ton anchors. The cables themselves are then going to run back to shore. They're going to be buried from the test site almost all the way back to shore. And then they're going to enter um, some conduits that are going to be buried, going to be installed using horizontal directional drilling. And I'll touch on that. Um, this is a, a cable ship doing a deployment, and this is a jet plow that would be used to bury the cables. The cables will be, as I mentioned, buried below the seafloor. There's a couple of reasons for that. One is so that they don't interfere with other ocean users. Um, it's also to protect the cables. These are multi-million dollar assets, so um, having them buried under the sands 
every feet or so will give them some level of protection. So this is sort of the near shore infrastructure. We have the um, conduits installed by, by horizontal directional drilling. Uh, we have a cable landing site, which is at a state park, Driftwood Beach State Recreation Site. Um, and then the cables will then run to our utility connection and monitoring facility about a third of a mile away from the cable landing site. Each of these HDD bores are about a mile long. Um, you can see here driftwood here, they go down, they go down about 100 feet under the beach um, and under the seafloor and then break out about a mile offshore. So a pretty significant engineering uh, undertaking to install these. Um, this is just a, a picture of one uh, HDD rig, uh, just to give you some idea of what the, what the, uh, the rigs themselves look like. We'll have two running at any, any one time. Um, everything in the state park is going to be, uh, once we've completed, will be underground. So there'll be almost no sign that we've been there. Uh, we are going to pretty much destroy a parking lot of the state park for construction and then rebuild it afterwards. As I said, then a terrestrial bore back to our utility connection and monitoring facility. Here you can see it more clearly. Um, and this facility we're going to be building. Sorry. Um, this is an, an architectural rendering of the facility. Basically, we'll have uh, uh, bays for each of the developers, secured individual bays and control rooms. Uh, we'll have a control building, which uh, will also uh, house all of PacWave's data and communication systems. So that's where we are. Um, hopefully, as I said, starting construction in June, operational in 2023. Um, I want to now shift to sort of how we got here. We started back in 2011. This was before my time, but the the first piece was working out where the site was going to be, and this was this was a community siting process. Um, we initially identified four communities along the Oregon coast for consideration: Warrington in the north, Newport, where we've ended up. Um, Reed's Port just further south and Coos Bay. And uh, at that stage, we had the catchy name of the Northwest National Marine Renewable Energy Center. Um, where I'll stick with PacWave as is much easier to say. Uh, the first stage was working with Oregon Sea Grant and um, the team held a series of meetings in each of those communities to, to assess community interest in having uh, Packway of South located in their community. Um, these happened in 2021 and 2022, uh, sorry, 2011 and 2012. Um, in September of 2012, it was narrowed down to Newport and Reedsport based on the level of community interest. And at that point, uh, each community formed a site selection committee, and this was made up of, of uh, local fishermen, um, the tribes, local government officials, resource agencies, stakeholders, other stakeholders, utility companies, and so on. And basically what each community, Reedsport and Newport did was put together a proposal as to why this facility should be located in their community. Uh, these proposals were submitted to our team in, in December of 2012. Um, they were reviewed by our team and outside subject matter experts and uh, Newport was selected as the location in January of 2013. So we had Newport located as the base for our operations and then the next step was to identify where our offshore test site was going to be. Um, we had a list of requirements, a list of criteria, um, which we provided to uh, local stakeholders. And then we really turned it over to them to decide where the site should be. Um, and most importantly, to the fishing community. Um, fishing is very important. Newport's the largest fishing port in, in Oregon. Um, Dungeness crab is the prime fishery. Um, 
fishing interests are represented by three different groups in Oregon. Um, to the north, there's a group called uh, Fishermen's Advisory Committee for Tillamook, or FAT. To the south is uh, the Southern Oregon Ocean Resource Coalition of Source. And in the Newport area in central, central Oregon coast, it's fine, fishermen involved in natural energy. And the fine committee was established by the county and its task was to review, is to review, but was to review um, any uh, wave energy test facility, facility application and particularly um, the siting of those and then make recommendations to the board of commissioners. Um, fine represents a broad spectrum of fisheries, um, including charter fishermen. So they, they were really the prime people in choosing our site. And this was before my time, but the story goes that um, they all met, they rolled out a chart, put it on the table. They talked about it for 20 minutes. And after 20 minutes, they pulled out a Sharpie and they drew a box on the chart and said, if you put it in there, we're okay with it. And that's where we ended up putting Packwave South was within that. This originally was a little over six square nautical miles. Our site is, is uh, two, but it took a while before we narrowed down to this. Um, we started off with the, the study area and then got into the permitting process properly. Um, I'm not going to go through this in detail, uh, but this gives you some idea. You got the jurisdictional line with state waters and federal waters. We cross both. So this just gives you some idea of the um, complexities of the regulations and jurisdictions that, that we were facing. Um, this is a list of the primary agencies and stakeholders that we worked with through our permitting process. We got federal, we got state, we have tribes, we have municipal, county, we have the utilities, and then we have various uh, other stakeholders, including fine and surf rider. Um, the two key federal agencies, because we're federally funded, were the, well, are the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. Uh, FERC, as they're known, we need a FERC license because we're generating power and BOEM, we need a BOEM lease to um, have the rights to use the outer continental shelf. Um, there is an MOU that was established between FERC and BOEM in, I believe, 2009 um, in preparation for projects like this. Um, and I believe this is the first time our project was the first time the MOU was actually applied. But what it meant was it was really up to them to decide who was going to be the lead agency. Um, and ultimately, it was decided that FERC would be the lead agency, and these other agencies signed on as cooperating agencies. And really, the key to having one lead agency and cooperating agencies is when we get to the authorizations that we need. And a key one is NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act, the NEPA analysis that needs to be done. In our case, it was an environmental assessment. By having FERC as the lead and the other agencies as cooperating agencies, it meant we only had to go through NEPA once. We could have had to go through multiple NEPAs and the whole NEPA process is a major undertaking. So this was a significant um, time and effort saving on everyone's behalf by being able to um, have a single NEPA process. But even with that, we can still see that we had to secure a large number of um, authorizations, permits and licenses for the project. Um, and we had to meet a lot of requirements for a lot of different acts. And I'm not gonna go into details of those, but as you can imagine, this took some time. And in fact, it took us about eight years. Um, the preliminary site selection is in yellow that I was just talking about. And blue is pretty much the permitting phase from 2013 to through to even into uh, 2021. Um, the permitting really kicked off in 2013 when we started meeting with that, that list of um, stakeholders and agencies that I just showed. Um, and in 2013, we also filed 
for a research lease. Um, that's important, not a commercial lease, but a research lease with Boeing. Um, and in 2014, that group, stakeholder group, uh, officially became what's called a collaborative work group. And we started the FERC licensing process. Um, there's three different approaches that you can have with FERC on your licensing. We selected the process called the alternative licensing process. Um, and I'm not going to go into details of the different processes, but basically the ALP um, allows for the greatest amount of collaboration and is the most flexible as far as timeline goes. Uh, both of these factors were critically important because one, nobody had really done what we were doing before. So to a certain extent, we were making it up as we were going along. And we realized that having hard deadlines um, and penalties for missing those deadlines was not going to be uh, was not going to be a viable option. Um, so then we worked through the proce uh, permitting process um, uh, over 40 meetings of our collaborative work group group day long or two day long meetings, and multiple other meetings, and we finally filed our draft license application to FERC in. Uh, April of 2018 and our final application in May of 2019. Um, we received our BOEM lease on February the 16th of this year, and we received our FERC license on March 1st, which is basically was the end of our permitting process. At that stage, the project was fully permitted. Um, our hope is that we will start construction. Our plan is that we'll start construction in June, uh, end by late 2022 and be operational by 2023. So a, a, a long process. And part of the reason the permitting process took such a long time goes back to this perceived environmental uncertainty that I talked about. Um, very few devices have been in the ocean uh, so uh, not much is known about the potential effects of them. And this slide just shows, you know, some of the different potential environmental effects that, that were of concern or potential concern. Um, what also made the process slow is we were trying to permit a test site. Um, and when you're developing a permit, when you're making a permit application, one of the critical things is your project description. What are you going to do? What's going to be out there? And for a test site, that was incredibly difficult. And if you remember back to, to the um, diversity of, of existing technology types, um, the agencies were turning to us and saying, well, what it, what's going to be out there? And we'd say, well, we don't know. Well, how many devices? We don't know. How long are they going to be out there? We don't know. What anchors are they going to use? We don't know. Um, so that was challenging. Uh, as far as the permitting process goes. We were also looking to have the site pre-permitted. Um, the idea behind this was that developers wouldn't have to go and get their own federal permits. Um, and this is significant because if they have to do that, there's you know several million dollars probably of expense and two or three years maybe. So pre-permitting means that we would get all the permits and then developers would be allowed to come in. They would still have to be vetted and produce a whole load of documentation, but it wouldn't have to go through a federal permitting process. Um, and that had never been done before. In fact, we were told categorically by some people that um, it couldn't be done. But we worked through it over the years. Um, and part of the way we addressed that was, um, and addressed some of these uncertainties, was we conducted a lot of studies uh, there was a number of reasons for these to, to uh, fill in data gaps, to identify what resources were actually of interest or concern, and also to establish baselines for future monitoring that was going to be required. And this is actually where being part of Oregon State University was very valuable because we have access to top scientists. We have a um, number of scientists who are key members of our core team, and we also have experts who we can call on subject matter experts. Uh, we also have a superb world-class uh, group of consultants working on this. So a whole series of terrestrial surveys and a whole series of marine surveys um, were conducted. Uh, 
And then what we did is working with the agencies, uh, we developed multiple plans to address some of these uncertainties and uh, what we would do in certain situations and establish protocols and procedures. And these most of these plans were approved by that group of, of stakeholders that you saw, the federal agencies and stakeholders. Uh, so that's part of the reason it took a while. One of the key things that was developed was an adaptive management framework. Um, so as with lots of other pro projects, adaptive management is the way that you deal with some of these uncertainties. Um, basically, our adaptive management framework allows an adaptive management committee to evaluate the results of our agreed monitoring, to make changes to monitoring plans and make decisions whether to modify existing mitigation measures that, that were developed. Um, our uh, AMC consists of Oregon State University, obviously, uh, National Marine Fisheries Service, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, BOEM, and Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife Service, mainly focused on resource agencies. So after having started with that suite of potential issues, we narrowed through the permitting discussions, through the process, we narrowed down to uh, four key monitoring areas, which are part of the ad adaptive management uh, framework, benthic monitoring, organism interactions, acoustics, and uh, EMF, and developed a series of um, mitigation measures. Uh, there's 10 of these. Um, all of these monitoring plans and mitigation measures have been incorporated into our FERC license. Um, and that's really what that whole process got us to. So after eight years of permitting, uh, we're now planning to start construction in June and be uh, operational in 2023. Uh, when I'm on the coast, people are always asking, when is this gonna happen? People want this to happen. Um, and one of the questions is why? And uh, you know, these are just my views, but I think, I think there's a genuine interest and support for renewable energy in Oregon, as long as it's compatible with other ocean uses. Um, the fishermen are okay with our project because it's a test site. Um, they see this as baby steps is the way they put it. Their view is let's see if this technology is actually viable before we start putting a whole load of devices out in the ocean. Um, I think one of the reasons, another reason people support this project is that it's, uh, an Oregon State University project. The university is, is trusted and respected. Um, Hatfield Marine Science Center, which is just down here in this picture, um, is in Newport. Uh, the, the people who work there are members of the community. Um, I think those who started the conversations with, with back in, the, in this uh, community selection process uh, fostered a genuine collaboration and engagement with the stakeholders, especially the fishing community. And all the way through, we have strived to continue that. Um, I think the community likes the idea of having a world-renowned wave energy test site um, located there. Someone said the other day, this will really put us on the map. Um, and of course, people see the potential economic development uh, capabilities, potential economic development that this may bring. Um, there was a study that was done a few years ago that suggested that uh, wave energy operations in Oregon could be worth an estimated $2.4 billion. Now, this is commercial, not, not testing, um, but uh, and that would include uh, almost $700 million in wages and uh, over 13,500 jobs. So there's potential there. We try very hard not to suggest uh, to be specific about potential uh, economic benefits. But what you can do is look at what's happened elsewhere in the world to get some idea. I'm gonna start by going to with EMEC. Um, EMEC in, is based in the Orkney Islands in Scotland and EMEC is the world's leading wave energy test site at the moment. They started wave energy test operations in 2003. They added tidal testing in 2006. So they're the one test site that there's a long history um, and there's been a certain amount of economic analysis based around that. Um, the population of Orkney is around 22,000 people. Um, EMEX 
on average producing 110 full-time equivalent jobs. So that's pretty good. Um, they've invested about $22 million into the economy in Orkney, and that's been supplemented with, by about $32 million from various economic and community development agencies. Um, so it's had a big impact on Orkney. One of the things that's interesting and is relevant to, to um, the Oregon communities and the Lincoln County communities and Newport is the energy related business uh, opportunities. Uh, in Orkney, there's about 40 energy related, marine energy related businesses employing about 250 people. And then there's a lot of services that, that experience mariners, anchor handling, harbor stuff, monitoring inspections maintenance, towage, all these things are liable to be uh, jobs that are going to increase and be available in the Newport area and in other communities along the coast. This is just one example of, of uh, something that happened in Orkney. This is a, a 700 ton gantry crane system that um, uh, after EMEC had started and was testing was identified for sale in Europe and a consortium of fishermen got together and brought this for I think a million pounds and it's become a key piece of infrastructure that's used for testing and this is actually the um, the Microsoft uh, data center being deployed it was deployed off at, at EMAC um, so one opportunity there where the fishermen got together and and invested money to support this and uh, uh, making money from renting this out for operations um, another really interesting spin-off of EMEC has been hydrogen. When I was there in 2017, this is their hydrogen facility. They were just building this. Um, their tidal test facility is just out here. They sort of built this just as a fun idea. Let's see what we can do with hydrogen as a way of storing energy. Um, and this has really taken off. As you can see here, this is the tidal site. This is where this picture is. Uh, generating hydrogen. They're now converting the inter-island ferry system to hydrogen. They have um, hydrogen stations for cars. They have trucks that are running on hydrogen. Uh, a spin-off of even that is people are now looking at hydrogen cell powered aircraft. And hydrogen is becoming a, a, a great interest in the US as, as a sort of additional factor to renewable uh, renewable energy and could be applicable to uh, wave energy. Moving closer to home, back into Oregon, um, one of the, the things that we've already seen as uh, economic benefits from wave energy is fabrication of devices. There have been a handful of devices fabricated by this company, Vigor, in Portland. Um, Vigor is a full service shipbuilding facility. Uh, they repair um, ships and so on, but they're also getting into complex fabrication, which is Sort of where wave energy converters come in. Um, the large facility, Swan Island, as you can see, a lot of cranes. It's got a 600 ton gantry crane that you'll see in a minute. Um, Vigor has taken over a couple of companies um, that have built wave energy converters, but just a couple that I want to touch on is um, this was the Ocean Power Technologies buoy. This is the company that got the FERC license um, before us, but didn't actually deploy off Oregon. Uh, but this device was built um, uh, in, in Portland. Um, this is uh, by, by Vigor, or at that time, Oregon Ironworks. You can see people here to give you some idea of scales of, of the device. And then this is 2019. This is the ocean energy device. I pointed out the uh, oscillating water column device previously. This is their full scale device. This is the OE35. This was in 2019. This was a six and a half million dollar contract that Vigor got to build this device. And as you can see, it's enormous. Uh, there's a group of people down here. This thing's 125 foot long. Uh, the, Black painted area is the area that would be below the waterline. That's 31 feet. Um, and it's it's Ocean Energy, which is an Irish company with an American subsidiary teamed with Siemens. Um, and uh, yes, a huge device. Uh, here it is it is completed. These are my colleagues uh, when we visited. Basically, oscillating water column. The water flows in here. This is the air chamber here. 
and this is the Siemens turbine at the top where the air, the air pumps in and out. So massive device. When it got round to getting it in the ocean, they had to put it in a dry dock or the river, sorry, um, to take it out to the ocean, float it out into the middle of the river to sink it. Um, and then it was towed all the way to Hawaii, uh, to a small test site in Hawaii. Um, and this is a picture from uh, March of 2020 when I was there. And this is the OE device in Pearl Harbor waiting to, for deployment. So you've got you know, shipbuilding facilities um, diversifying into a wave energy converter uh, construction um, already happening in Oregon. Um, and I think Viga have built four different devices, um, which, you know, is a large percentage of the number of devices that have been built in the US. And then moving sort of back to PacWave and uh, the Newport area, got Newport um, here, and then you have Toledo up the river. If we just zoom in, most of the, the um, marine industrial center of Newport is here. Um, but as you go up the Yaquina River, there's this small boatyard in Toledo, which I just want to touch on because it, it's an interesting story. Um, the boatyard closed in 2008, but reopened in 2011 uh, when the city of Toledo secured a 1.7 million state uh, of state funding. As you can see, it's a pretty small boatyard. Um, there's a couple of finger piers here for a travel lift that you'll see, some buildings, some dockage, um, but pretty limited in scope. Um, in 2012, we started using it. This is the Ocean Sentinel, which is the uh, uh, mobile test berth that we use at PacWave North. Um, we started staging it out of Toledo in 2012 and are still still have it there and are still using Toledo as the base for the, the Ocean Sentinel operations. This is the travel lift in the background and this is actually a wave energy converter. Um, this device is the Wet NZ device, um, which is I think a third scale device that was tested at PacWave North, our north site in 2012, and the travel lift about to uh, move it to the water. And then this is it being uh, actually at our site. Uh, so with all the activity that was happening with Toledo, it was recognized as a primary opportunity for economic development and job growth. Um, partly through that, it received $4.7 million in, of, in an infrastructure grant to expand significantly. So expanded up to this area and you can see these two larger finger piers, which is for this 660 ton travel lift that they invested in. This travel lift, I believe, was the largest one between San, no, between LA and Alaska. Um, largely designed to deal with uh, the local fishing fleet, um, but also uh, Newport supports Alaskan fishing vessels, vessels that are based in Newport and then fish in Alaska. This 660 ton lift gave them the capabilities to deal with those, but also the capabilities to potentially deal with, with wave energy converter deployments. This was the first vessel that was pulled. This is uh, the fishing boat Timmy Boy, uh, which is uh, owned by uh, Captain Bob Edda, who's one of the local crabbers and is on the fine committee and who we work with a lot. We've actually chartered the Timmy Boy a couple of times to do work for us in support of PacWave. Uh, just to point out that the travel lift is painted in OSU colors, uh, orange and black. That was not under duress from OSU. That was just a decision by the boatyard to show its support for the university. And then finally, the boatyard uh, is now building a 94 foot tall building uh, with another $2.9 million of economic support that's, that they received. And this is just an example, of, you know, wave energy is not the driving force behind this, but it's definitely one of the factors that the port management and the city of Toledo are taking into account as they're looking to make these investments. And normally when they're making these investments, they're checking with us whether this is something that's going to be of use. 
there's a lot of interest and there's a lot of support for this project at a local level all the way up to the federal delegation. Um, there's likely a lot of reasons for this um, and uh, they may not be applicable necessarily to other projects, but I think there's some key reasons. One, this is a limited scale project and due to our permits, we can't scale up to some commercial operation. So, so we're not seen as having our foot in the door. If they open the door to testing, did they open the door to commercialization? So we can't be commercial and that's really important. We're providing a service to the marine industry and that's very clear to, to the community and to others. Um, this is really more of a research and development project. Um, and that, that people are comfortable with because the scale is limited. Um, it's been led by Oregon State University, which I think is really important because the university is known and trusted and has an existing local presence um, in the community. Uh, one of our primary liaisons during the first few years was the local marine fishery specialist with Sea Grant. Um, and she is from Newport. Um, she's also the daughter of a fisherman. And I think having that local person involved was critically important because again, she was known and trusted and understood the fishing industry. Um, I think one of the critical things is our engagement with stakeholders early and in an honest and open way. Um, we've tried to continue that. We listened, we continue to listen. Um, stakeholders, and everyone says this, but it's true, stakeholders have had and continue to have a place at the table. They are key players in what is going on. And our hope is that this support will continue as we move through the construction phase and into testing operations in 2023. Um, I will finish there. I hope that this was useful and I look forward to taking questions during the webinar itself.